about colligative properties. It's going to be a little longer than our normal videos, um, just because it's a little bit of a bigger topic, and I have quite a few examples for you. Um, so colligative property is going to get broken into three major parts. Vapor pressure lowering, freezing point depression, and boiling point elevation. And they'll be in this order. So colligative properties are properties that are dependent upon the number of solute particles, which are the ions of the solute. And they're not dependent on what the actual solute is. It's dependent upon what that solute breaks into. So these are physical properties of a solution. And these physical properties of the solution are going to differ from those uh, physical properties of a pure solvent, even the pure solvent that is used to make that solution. So like I said, there's three properties. The first is vapor pressure lowering. This is where if we increase the amount of solute in our solvent, we're actually going to decrease, decrease the vapor pressure of that solvent. For freezing point of pressure, we're going to increase our amount of solute, and that's going to decrease my freezing point of my solution. And then I have boiling point elevation. Here I'm increasing my solute again, notice for all three. This time that's going to increase the boiling point of my solution. So we can have an impact with this for freezing point depression, like putting salt on the roads. Um, boiling point elevation is an example of this would be adding salt to water, although you need a lot of salt to the water. And that allows your water to boil at a hotter temperature. So that's increasing the boiling point of water from 0 degrees or 100 degrees Celsius up to um, whatever that would be, depending on how much salt you add. Um, same with the freezing point depression by putting salt on the roads that lowers the melt or the freezing point of water so it stays liquid at colder temperatures so you don't have their ice on the roads. So what is vapor pressure? Well, vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a vapor that is in a dynamic equilibrium with its liquid. So it means that it's equally um, able to be in the vapor form and it's not moving around too much. And then we have stuff that's called non-volatile. These are liquids that are not easily going to go into the gaseous phase. They're going to want to stay as a liquid. Uh, VPL, this is just vapor pressure lowering. So this is the vapor pressure of a solvent containing a non-volatile solute. So that just means that your sol or, yep, solute um, isn't going to go into the gas phase quickly is going to be lower than the vapor pressure of that pure solvent. So your vapor pressure lowering is going to be dependent upon the number of ions the molecule dissociates or breaks apart into. So two examples that I have a pure solvent here, notice there's just little black dots representing the pure uh, solvent molecules versus a solution where I have my solute as my red molecules inside mix it out with my solvent which is the black molecules. In my pure solvent I have an equilibrium established between the liquid and the vapor equally. Um, the molecules are free to move back and forth with ease. In my solution my solute particles, the big red ones, are going to reduce the number of free solvent particles that are able to escape into liquid. So there's less um, solvent going into the vapor phase. Um, therefore, that's going to decrease or lower my vapor pressure. So an example of this would be looking at what has a lower pressure. Um, glucose in water, uh, calcium chloride in water, or sodium chloride in water. And this has to do with the number of ions it dissociates into. Uh, two moles of sodium chloride going in, uh, we would have our two sodium ions and our two chlorine ions, because for each mole we'd have one of each. Um, so we'd have four total ions in that solution. If we had the two moles of calcium chloride, or two molecules of calcium chloride coming in, we would have two calcium ions, and then we would have four chlorine ions, um, one, two, three, four, because it's a two to one. Then we have glucose. Well, glucose doesn't break apart into ions. It stays together as one unit. Um, so we actually wouldn't have any ions in there. So the more ions, the lower the pressure. So because my calcium chloride dissociates into 
um, when I have two molecules of calcium chloride and the six ions, that's going to have um, the most ions present, therefore the lowest vapor pressure. Okay, so on to freezing point depression. This is the difference between the freezing points of our pure solvent in a non-electrolyte solution that a solvent, or a non-electrolyte solution that's in the solvent. So a non-electrolyte solution um, is being added to a solvent and it's creating a solution here that does not conduct electricity. Um, our freezing point depression is directly proportional to the molal concentration of the solution. So that's why the previous video we talked about molality. Um, so if you haven't watched that, you should go back. Uh, this will make much more sense then. For freezing point depression, if the molal concentration is 1 molal, the freezing point depression is going to be 1.86 degrees Celsius for water. Other liquids um, will have, and other substances will have different um, amounts that it's going to um, decrease depending on with 1 molal. Um, and there's a table in your book that tells you those two. Um, some more terms is we have our change of freezing point, um, how much it lowers. And we looked at this as your magnitude, so it's always going to be a positive number. This is the magnitude of your freezing point depression is delta Tf. And that's going to be equal to the molal of the solute, or of your solution. So the molal of your solution times your Kf. Now, Kf is your molal freezing point depression constant. Uh, the Kf for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius, kilogram water, per one mole of solute. And this comes back to that the molal concentration for uh, one molal of water has a freezing point depression of 1.86 degrees Celsius. So that's where this constant comes from. That does not change. Your new freezing point after you add your solute in is going to be equal to 0 degrees Celsius for water. Subtracting from that your change in freezing point, so how much it actually decreased, will tell you what your new freezing point is. And that's pretty uh, straightforward. So the first example you want to go through, this is example one in your book, or in your note packet. And it asks you, what is the freezing point depression of water in a solution of 17.1 grams of sucrose, which is C12H22O11, and 200 grams of water? So I've taken the initiative, I've recorded my variables first, just like you should. I'm looking for my magnitude of the freezing point depression, given my grams of sucrose, given my grams of water. I know my solute is the sucrose, my solvent is the water. So I have my equation. I know that my delta Tf is equal to molal times my uh, molal freezing point depression constant, or Kf. And I know that molal is equal to moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. Now because I don't know my molal, I have to solve for it. And to do that, I need to have moles in kilograms, so I need to change my kilograms per or my grams to kilograms for my solvent, and my grams to moles for my solute. My solute was my sucrose, so I take my 17.1 grams, I divide by the molar mass of sucrose, and I get an amount of moles to be 0.05 moles of sucrose. I take my 200 grams of water, now there is 1,000 grams in a kilogram, so I divide this number by 1,000, it's moving the decimal point three places to the left, and I get a number of 0.2 kilograms of water. I take my solute mole divided by my kilograms of water, and I get a molality of 0.25 molals. Now I know molality. Now I know my Kf from before, so I can solve now for delta Tf. Delta Tf is equal to 0.25 molals per kilogram of water times my Kf, which is 1.86 degrees Celsius kilograms water per one mole. Multiply the two together and I get a change in temperature 
of a depression of 0 0.465 degrees Celsius. Knowing that the TF here tells me that it's freezing, I know that for freezing it's going to be a lowering, so I know that this is the new freezing point is going to be 0 minus this number. Okay, example two. Example two reads, a water solution containing an unknown quantity of a molecular solute is found to have a freezing point of negative 0.23 degrees Celsius. What is the molal concentration of the solution? Again, I record my variables. I'm given that my freezing point is equal to negative 0.23 degrees Celsius. I know my Kf for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius times kilograms of water per mole of solute. I can solve for my delta Tf by knowing that my freezing point is equal to 0 minus my delta Tf. A little rearranging of algebra and I get my delta Tf is equal to 0 minus my freezing point. 0 minus a negative 0 0.23 degrees Celsius gives me a positive 0 0.23 degrees Celsius. Now I know Tf, I know Kf, so I can solve for molal. I have delta Tf is equal to your molal times your Kf. Solving for molal, I get molal is equal to delta Tf divided by Kf. I know my delta Tf here is 0 0.23 degrees Celsius. My Kf is the constant for water, 1.86 degrees Celsius kilograms of water divided by one mole of solute. When I plug this in my calculator, I get 0 0.124 moles per kilogram, or 0 0.124 molals. At this time, go ahead and try practice problems number one and number two. Your answer for number one should be negative 0 0.424 degrees Celsius. Your answer for number two should be 0 0.174 molals. So as you can see from doing these problems, we know why we have to put salt on the road. Uh, a better question would be, which one is better for the road, sodium chloride or calcium chloride? And again, that's going to relate back to my vapor pressure lowering and the number of ions. If you uh, go to the store in the wintertime, you might notice that you have a couple options for putting salt on your driveway. Um, you can either choose to get sodium chloride or you can choose to get calcium chloride. You notice that calcium chloride is a little more expensive. But that's because it actually works a little better because of how many ions it dissociates into. So how could this have an effect on your boiling points of water or your boiling points of other solutions? Alright, the last thing we're going to learn about, we're getting there, is your boiling point elevation. Now your boiling point elevation is the difference in temperature between the boiling point of a solution and the boiling point of a pure solvent, just like freezing point depression. Your boiling point of water is going to increase 0 0.512 degrees Celsius for every one mole of particles that the solute forms when dissolved in 1,000 grams or 1 kilogram of water. Again, very similar to the freezing point depression. Here, for my change in temperature, so my change in temperature, my boiling point elevation, is going to have a little B next to it for boiling to distinguish it from the freezing point. Delta T is equal to molal times KB. Here, KB for water is 0 0.51 degrees Celsius per, or times kilograms of water per one mole of solute. Same units before us with freezing. Again, this number comes from what happens when we have one mole of particles. And to figure out our boiling point, we take 100 degrees Celsius, the normal boiling point of water, and we add our change in temperature. Now for boiling, it's an elevation, so it's going to have a positive delta T um, because we are increasing the temperature. So problem steps and questions are going to be the same as freezing point depression. Uh, so we won't go through any examples, but just you're going to follow the same thing. Um, all you're really changing is the little suffix of B or F, and you need to just choose your K appropriately.
Now this slide is for the next video.